Well, I think it, it's not different from other regions of the world. It's a nation state geographic d division, is, I think that's how you put it. Um, and, and those, you know, don't reflect many realities, they don't reflect the um, interconnections between different peoples um, across those boundaries. So, um, I mean, a good example, I think, is that. Um, in northern Iraq, which is the country I'm originally from, um, the people of northern Iraq are very closely connected to the people of the Levant, of Syria, and in some ways to the people of southern Turkey. And, um, and after those boundaries were formed in the uh, early to mid 20th century, they cut those people off from each other. And that's one small to not so small example, but there's many, many examples throughout the history of the world, whether you look at uh, the Middle East, whether you look at South Asia, whether you look at um, Eastern Asia, um, Africa, um, where that happened, and 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 so that's one problem. Um, there are uh, problems that are more, I think, um, let's say, intellectual w with those boundaries. Is that whenever you the the conventional map that we consume in in the mass media and in most um, like school geography textbooks and history textbooks tends to assume that those are natural boundaries or tends to reinforce the assumption that those are natural and historically deep boundaries and, and they tend to obscure um, the interconnections between different countries and, and they tend to um, reinforce the idea that the na that national identity is the only or the most important identity uh, in the world and, and that's not the case. There's a very famous geographer who um, once said, his name is J.B. Harley, and, and he wrote um, on cartography. He wrote in the 19, I think, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And he said that cartography is unique among the arts in being solely a, an, an aesthetic of power. Um, so, you, you know, if you look at music, he said, there's popular music and there's elite music. If you look at um, poetry. There's the poetry of courts and kings and there's the poetry of everyday people, folk poetry or wh whatever you call it. But cartography is pretty different, he argued, um, uh, because it's, modern history at least, is uh, as a technology of um, trying to find, it, it does two things in modern history uh, basically, which is either trying to establish the location of, let's say, resources or um, or various sort of populations, uh, flora and fauna, whatever, that a state wants to know about and to administer in some way. Um, or, uh, and related to that in some ways, is maps are used to obscure um, the existence of other claims to territory. So, for example, you know, mapping in colonial America, which claimed land that really belonged to the indigenous peoples, um, but claim that land for the settlers, right? And so um, I don't think it's the problem is not inherently in boundaries per se, but it's like we have to think about mapping as a technique of power and what it is doing in terms of uh, political claims on on the planet Earth, generally speaking. And uh, you know, one and secondly, how those maps reflect the often unconscious assumptions of the mapping. Uh, authority or the mapping people, the, the, the cartography, the, the culture from which the cartography is coming from. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong by saying that, you know, mosques are a typical architecture of, you know, Muslim spaces, spaces where ma there are many Muslims, you know. Um, but it's, it's more that, that sort of the overwhelming majority of um, representations tend to emphasize um, these built forms as, you know, we, we tend to make this assumption that there's this built form and from that form there's a particular cultural identity that is related in a direct way to that form, right? And that may be the case, but that question is, is, is you, you need to do more research and you need to do, you need to find out about how people relate to that space and what they, how they make meaning of that space before making that assumption about their identity because, um, you know, for example, like a mosque, right, is very often a, uh, funded by a state or funded by a particularly wealthy, um, let's say, family or something, and, um, or any architectural project, really any big one, is going to 
be uh, it's going to be funded in a certain way. It's going to be uh, th th those funders are going to have a lot of say over what it looks like. And and so when you go, you know, to a country like the United Arab Emirates, and you notice that a lot of the mosques there look like they come from medieval Egypt, right? Um, if if you know if you dig a bit deeper, you see like the style is not connected to the local culture. Then you ask, you know, what who is building the mosque, right? Why are they making it in this image? And you find out it's often like the, the ruler of the principality or the particularly influential person wants to be seen as a, like uh, associated with that built form and, and reflecting a certain idea about, you know, Islamic civilization that, that doesn't reflect, you know, maybe other people's views of it. So, in so sort of taking for granted and overemphasizing cultural difference is that we, which by the way I don't, I'm not trying to deny, right, that, uh, that's not what I'm saying, that there are of course differences between different cultures and, and those are often important differences, but there are also um, other and often bigger factors that play in social political behavior and one of the big factors for me is always global, uh, capitalism at a global scale and how it tends to um, be manifested in particular places. And, and one of the things that um, the whole world is going through, uh, really, in, in, since the 1970s, are similar experiences with the with deindustrialization in many countries, um, especially the Western former industrial powers, um, with uh, the, 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 with the, the decline of the public sector. Um, so in many European countries and many Middle Eastern countries, um, the public sector is quite big and quite, um, it's a source of often jobs or source of subsidies and, uh, and people are used to a kind of, you know, a basic sort of, um, basic like um, floor, right? Um, Egypt, for example, for a long time after the 1952 revolution, the state would subsidize food, basic foods, right? Bread would be subsidized and many of the um, strikes and revolts would be related to the threat of cutting those subsidies, right? And so, um, of course, people in the United States are not revolting about bread subsidies, you know, that's an obvious difference. Um, although you can make the case that there is a problem of hunger in the U.S., of course. But um, similarly, I think people in the U.S. now are becoming very concerned with and very anxious about and very angry about um, the, the, the diminishing of the economic opportunities and the, the fact that they can no longer count on you know having a stable job and, and these are very similar. Of course in the US you know many communities have suffered these things for a long time and now it's just I think more let's say white middle class people are realizing that their life chances are diminishing and it's becoming more visible in the media, but um, it's, it, you know, jobs and economic opportunities and, and not just that, like the, po the political structures that provide for these economic conditions or don't provide for them are becoming questioned across the world. And, and I don't think that's accidental. I don't think, I think that's part of, I think that's, that's shaped by the history since the 1970s of neoliberalism. Yeah.